Yeah. All right. So last week we we just breached our subject on um, the doctrine and providence and problem of evil. Um, we talked about uh, the reality of evil. We talked about the dark side of creation. Um, and remember, we we broke it down, or Guthrie breaks it down into two categories, right? And what are those two categories of evil in the world? Does anyone remember? Oh, it sounds like someone's at the door. Yeah, I'll get it for you, Patty. I'll get it. Um, what are the two categories of evil that Guthrie divides it into? Human finitude and natural law. Well, you have it's natural evil, right. which is what? Oh, and moral evil. Right. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Right. So, natural evil. What would we say would be included in natural evil? Earthquakes. Earthquakes. Severe weather. Severe weather. I mean, look at our poor neighbors on the East Coast right now. Forty foot uh, waves mm -hmm. on the Outer Banks of North Carolina. I mean, the waves just are are the waves are actually coming down over the homes. Wow. And you're talking about two, three-story homes, you know, stilt yeah. homes on the beach. It's, it's unreal. So natural evil, Guthrie would say, these are the things that naturally occur in the world. Volcanoes, earthquakes. President um, Trump. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other one is a moral evil. And that is evil that we do upon each other. Right? So you would say Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Pol Pot, Right? You, you know, people that you would say, or, and it could be someone, you know, someone who commits murder, right? These are people, you know, who do evil things. These are humans. Just a person, I mean, it could be a movement like slavery, right? Or yes, right, or right. Mm -hmm. That's a systemic, but it's, lots, it is humans. Lots, it is humans. Lots of people. Right, it is humans, though. So it would be a moral oh, evil, right? It would be humans... Yeah. Uh, doing evil on other humans, right, or the world or, or systems. All right, so we are talking about the dark side of creation as of right now. I think that's where we ended. I don't believe we... No, we didn't get to flip the page yet. So there's... Uh, so he breaks it down. So human finitude. The good, the bad... The good and the bad of being a finite creature. Real evil centers... Real evil enters the picture when we refuse to accept the finitude of human life or try to play God with our own or other or others' lives. All right, so when we think about moral evil, right, as humans, think about what it means. All right, think about what Guthrie is trying to say when we try to play God with our own or others' lives. What does that statement mean? Oh, yeah, narcissism definitely is involved in this. Um, what what does God have the power to do? Everything. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and so when we try to play God, you know, in essence, when we're committing moral evil, you know, taking lives, damaging lives, you know, doing things that, you know, we shouldn't be doing. Right? We are damaging others' lives. Uh, damaging God's creation. Damaging God's creation. That's right. Because, And remember, in the earliest chapter, in the earliest portion of this chapter, God's creation is good. It is. Right? If we believe the scriptures, creation is good, which includes all of us. All right? And Guthrie is going gonna, is gonna to build up um, a platform to continue this. Because remember, theology is, is a system. And so you build, like with building blocks or mathematics, you build upon smaller systems, uh, smaller concepts, and it, it builds upon itself. And so Guthrie is going to do this. So if, if humanity is good, if humans are good, and there is evil out there in the world, I don't think anyone could walk around with blinders that big to say that, oh no, there's no evil in the world. Uh, you're not looking. And I wouldn't even say you're not looking hard enough. You're just not looking. You don't even have to look hard. All you have to do is open a page of the, new, the front page of the paper and you see it. Um, so it's there. And so Gut how is Guthrie going to deal with this? 
theologically, because that's important, because that's what Guthrie, that's who Guthrie was. He was a theologian, a professor, a minister. All right, so natural law. The world is not in, oh, yeah, I think we did this, this I remember doing last week. So the world is not an unpredictable chaos, but at least a relatively ordered, intelligible system of interrelated parts that function in a relatively consistent way we can count on. What is Guthrie saying? The sun rises in the morning and yep. sets in yes. the evening and yes. blah, blah, blah. Life goes on. So what about natural disasters? <clears throat> Although we cannot control them because nature typically runs on this, on laws itself, you know, we know about hurricanes. We know, her, and if you grew up in Florida like I did from 15 years on, you know, you learn a lot about hurricanes. You learn a lot that they either, they're born on the coast of Africa or somewhere in the Caribbean, and they kind of make this trek like this, and it has to do with cold fronts and how they're pushed this way or that way, or if something does, a front doesn't come, the hurricane can barrel straight through. Uh, so we know about hurricanes, right? We have learned more and more about tornadoes. You have uh, scientists who work on earthquakes all the time. Um, we know about fault lines. So it's not just like, it's not that nature just runs on this wild willy-nilly course, right? It's not just you wake up one morning and a hurricane pops up over your house. It doesn't work like that. So we Unless know. You're what's that? Unless you're Eeyore. Unless you're Eeyore, then poor Eeyore. <laughs> he always has that dark cloud yeah. over his head. Uh, so we know how hurricanes work. So what, you know, what Guthrie is saying that we take certain amounts of risks. So if we want to build houses on the beach, great. I love it. It's beautiful. It's peaceful. I mean, it's, it's lovely. But you also are rolling the dice for storms, right? If you build in an area where th there is a high risk of forest fire, you know, and I'm not saying that people who do this, well, of course it had to happen to them. What, is, what Guthrie is saying that there is a risk for it because we do understand how these natural systems work, right? That we take a risk to do certain things. Um, so it's relatively ordered. Right? So creation, it's, it's not willy-nilly. It's, it's not a bunch of gods sitting on Mount Olympus saying, you know, whose day am I going to make horrible today? <laughs> you know, <laughs> let's release the crack and, and, and you know, and, and, uh, and flood San Antonio. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. And yet Mother Nature is neither our friend nor our enemy. She operates by her own rules that are sometimes beneficial and sometimes harmful to us. Right? So nature can be absolutely beautiful. And nature can be absolutely deadly. Um, anyone who has spent any time on the Gulf of Mexico, you know, sometimes it literally looks like a, a, a piece of glass. I mean, like literally you can just walk out on it as far as you can see. I mean, it's absolutely still. It's unreal. And then I've been right on the, I've been at a, at a hotel restaurant on the Gulf and I've seen storms roll in. And you've seen that yeah. same sheet of glass become very angry. Um, and so it, it is what it is. But it is not, it's not our friend, it's, not, it's nature, right? We, we personify, you know, we, we give it this, we personify it. We give it human-like qualities. We call it Mother Nature, right? Oh, Mom's angry today. <laughs> but, you know, in, in reality, it's not. It's creation, right? It's God's creation. And, you know, it's, it's almost like it's a neutral thing. You know, it follows laws and systems of its own. And so, at it's times... It's not arbitrary. Yeah, it's not arbitrary. Um, thank you, Miriam. <laughs> oh, the sermon. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, I am going to forget it. Okay, yeah, I'm sure everyone else didn't want me to forget it either. Yeah. Because then I would just sit at the pulpit and ramble for a half hour. <laughs> it would be very painful. <laughs> so, Mother Nature, she just acts upon these laws, right? And it's, again, to, to personify creation and nature, it, it's cute. I do it with my son. Um, but as adults, we must understand that, you know, nature doesn't have it out for anybody. You know, there, there are laws... 
that nature follows and, you know, we must do our best to try to figure them out. Um, but we cannot control it, you know. So, yes, we can harness the power of the sun or the wind, great, and we can make electricity and power, um, but when floods happen, right, when tornadoes hit, when hurricanes roll through, when big earthquakes hit, I mean, you know, it's just we can prepare for them, but nature is, is extreme power. I mean, it, it's just raw, raw power. And so that's why Guthrie adds this section of natural evil, because people lose their lives. People die sometimes from, uh, from nature. Look at this tsunami. How many people died because of that? Is it 175,000? It was a huge number. I mean, I remember reading the paper, and every day the number, you know, would just tick, tick, tick. It would just keep going high, but thousands, you know. And, and to, to hear that number, it, it's, it's disheartening to think about. That many people died because of one, one thing from nature. So, yeah, nature is, is very powerful. Nature is very powerful. All right, so now we're going to go and hear from Guthrie for a moment. So there's a question. Is God responsible for the suffering that results from natural causes? Have our views as Christians changed from earlier Christians? And let's hear what Guthrie has to say. Human responsibility and negligence. Many natural evils are at least partially the result of our own neglect or refusal to take advantage of the ability God has provided us to care for our own and others' safety and welfare. If a plane crashes, should we ask God? Should we ask why God let it happen or why safety measures were not enforced? If millions of people around the world are hungry and homeless, should we ask God, ask why God allows it to happen or why we do? If I get sick, is it because God has not taken care of me or is it because I have disregarded the rules of health that enable me to take care of myself? If there is so much sickness, disease, and suffering in the world around us, is it because God doesn't care or because we don't? If a hurricane brings death and destruction to people who live or have summer homes along a beach, should we ask why God created a world in which hurricanes can happen or why we build homes, sometimes flimsily built ones, in hurricane-prone areas. Human negligence, selfishness, or, uncon or unconcerned cause, many forms of evil we like to blame God for. And human intelligence and goodwill can remedy many forms of evil we think God ought to do something about. Tragedy and suffering come that no one could prevent and that no one is responsible for. We do not have to torment ourselves by assuming that misfortune is always our own fault, anxiously asking, what did I do to deserve this? And it is cruel to allow or encourage others to torment themselves with the suggestion that their misfortune is always their own fault, the consequence of something that they have done or not done. Nothing is more unfair than blaming the victim. <clears throat> Nevertheless, sometimes, and that's italicized, Misfortune and suffering are clearly the consequence of our neglect or refusal to provide for our own or others' welfare, and it does not help to ignore or deny it. Even in such cases, however, Christians can remind themselves and others of a God who does not hold grudges and seeks vengeance but loves and forgives sinners, a God who promises to be with us and for us even in the consequences of our sinfulness. So Guthrie opens up and says, you know, and, and it's interesting because some of these things, you know, we might have heard on the news. Maybe we have said them ourselves somewhere, sometime in our lives, um, when we think about things that are in our control. And then he moves into the natural realm of things and saying that, you know, why did God send a hurricane? You know, and, and so when, when we think about that, and we do hear it. All you have to do is turn on the telly and you will see some minister blaming the people of that area for the natural disaster that had just <laughs> smashed them. They, they do. They blame them. They blame them for their sin, how they live, what they support, who lives in their town. Um, it happens. 
it happens with both natural disasters and and moral disasters, right? It happens. It happened with 9/11. Yep, I remember. It happened with 9/11, um, and it's it's this idea that we can know what is going on in God's mind during these things, which to me is a very dangerous game, because how do you know? You don't know. We don't know. You know, it's our job to help pick up pieces. It's our job to show God's love in the aftermath, right? You don't see God's face within the, in the tragedy. You see it after the tragedy as you come in and you act as Christians, outpouring of love to help and do what we can do. Um, and so this has always occurred, and it will continue to occur, unfortunately, there's nothing I can do except tell you don't turn on those TV channels. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think what, what we do when, when people do that as humans is we create a God in the image of humanity. So it is exactly. a human God. Yeah. Right. A God that gets angry. Right. A God that doesn't forgive and takes revenge. That's right. I'm going to show you. That's right. That's what we do. That's right. And that's the God that they are portraying. That's right. And these are the gods of the Greeks and the Romans. Yep. Right? That's how the it's Greeks... A pagan, we create a pagan a god. A pagan god. That's exactly correct. It's idolatrous. And so we are doing no... It's no different than the Greeks or the Romans who say, Oh, you're drunk. Well, uh, we need to have a god that does that. Bacchus, you know, or Dionysus, you know. That's why you're drunk, because a god did that to the grape juice, and now it's wine. Right? Not looking at the fermentation process, of course, and why this does this to humanity. Or, you know, your house was destroyed by a storm. Well, you really <clears throat> made Zeus angry today. Right? And it's doing that. It's personifying these gods in our image. That's correct. That's a great way to look at it. It's a, and that will continue to occur, unfortunately. Although, to be fair, that does happen a lot in the Old Testament. I mean, it does happen a lot in the Old Testament. Right. It does happen a lot in the Old Testament. That, that, that is correct. Exactly there, there were you, you, at the time. you do see it. You do see it. You know, there is an action and then there's a reaction by God. So, well, yes. That's why Jesus came to say, you know, to tell us. I think right. so. Right. It's like, that's what you used to think, but this is the way it is. Right. Right. And think about, you know, even when Jesus approached, when they approached, Jesus and his disciples approached someone who is. Uh, has a handicap, and I can't remember which one it was, like what handicap it was, and the disciples say, who sinned? Oh, yeah, the blind, the blind. Was I he a, a blind man or a par I can't remember if he was blind or paralyzed. Who sinned? And Jesus turned around and said, no one. You know, this, it, this is here. He's here so God can, God's glory can be, you know, and then Jesus heals him. You know, but it's this this understanding, and Jesus moving religion or an understanding of the law into a different neighborhood saying that this whole concept of curses and blessings is going to be gone and it's all going to be replaced by grace and it's all going to be replaced by grace <clears throat> right so yeah big stuff very big stuff so I never, uh, thought about natural disasters as evil i mean there's no person involved doing bad behavior, unless you want to ascribe it to Satan or something. But uh. Yeah. Yeah. And that's good. And that's, and that's theologically good, Don. You know, it, I, I think that Guthrie is doing this to say that, you know, it's not that nature has a mind of its own. It's not that, you know, nature is out for anybody. It's right. these things that happen, you know, people will, you know, look at and say, oh my gosh, you know, my life is destroyed because of this hurricane or this tornado. And it, yeah. we can't turn a blind eye to that because it, these things do happen, right? People's lives are disrupted and sometimes destroyed because of uh, natural disasters. And, uh, yeah. It's a problem of suffering, not evil. Yeah, I think it's right. <coughs> the end result is the suffering. And people do suffer mm -hmm. from natural disasters, right? It's not something that we need to trivialize. You know, we need to say it, these do happen, and as long as the earth is the earth, they will continue to happen, right? Um, and it's, it's learning more about why they happen and prevention and what we can do to help afterwards, of course. Yeah, very good, very good. All right, so, and Guthrie goes further and says there are unanswered questions. What we have said about human finitude, the laws of nature, and human responsibility may have helped us understand a little better the pain, suffering, and death 
that are the consequences of the natural evil. That is the dark side of God's good creation. But our discussion has left two very important questions unanswered. First, granted that suffering, pain, and death are a part of every human life, why do they come when, where, and how they do? Why do some people suffer more than others? Why do some have more tragedy in their lives than anyone should have to bear? Why do good people who don't deserve it sometimes suffer more than bad people do? Why the debilitating disease, the tragic accident, or the death of a child or young person whose life is just beginning? Why is a family deprived of the support and care of a father or mother it desperately needs? Why must an older person have to suffer so long? Why is a nation or business deprived of a leader upon whom so much and so many depend? Or more concretely, why me? Why my child, my mother or father, my husband or wife, my friend? Why them and not me? Why all those other people around the world whom God loves just as much as God loves us? Why them and not us? The questions are endless. And the answer? We don't know why. What we know about human finitude, the laws of nature, human responsibility, and the consequences of irresponsibility can sometimes give us partial answers, but in the last analysis, we just don't know. Should not pretend that we do, and do not have to feel guilty because we don't. We can do what we can to relieve our own and others' suffering. We can stand by one another to share one another's suffering and grief to make it a little easier. But the one thing we cannot do and should not try to do is explain why. Especially with glib talk about the will of God or speculation about what people do or do not deserve, there is a dark side of creation that is simply a mystery to us. What we can do is what we have in fact already begun to do in our discussion of the dark side of God's good creation, without even trying to explain why it invades our lives, when, where, and how it does. We can remind ourselves and others of the light that shines in the darkness, the light of a loving God who understands and shares the depths of our suffering and dying, the light of a powerful God whose will for our good will not be defeated, who is stronger than death itself, who makes the dead live again. But how do we know that this kind of God talk is not just whistling in the dark, the wishful thinking of those who try to make themselves feel better when the shadow of the dark side of creation falls across their lives? Unlike the why questions, Christians do have an answer to this question. But before we talk about it, we need to talk about another kind of evil that makes faith in God even more difficult and more important. And that one we'll get to next week. So let's unpack this section. So, when we think about the things that happen in our world, right, um, about why, the question why, uh, one of the things that you learn as a minister really fast, <laughs> really fast, and if you don't learn the lesson in seminary, and if you have to learn it by experience, it could be a painful lesson to learn, is, again, not to try to explain why why bad things happen. That, you know, we can do lots of things to help comfort. We can be there. But to try to understand the why in the, in the midst of tragedy, to try to explain that to someone, even when someone asks you why, why did my, why did my son die, right? Why did this have to happen? The best answer, according to Guthrie, and I probably think every other seminary on earth, is, I don't know. I don't know. And I'm sorry, and I'm here. What can I do to help? Uh, if we try to answer why, right, if, if we feel that this is the point where this individual needs a lecture, <laughs> which they don't, <laughs> right, <laughs> it, right, you will continue down a slippery slope because there is no way to understand why. We don't have that answer. There might be a why, and God might understand that why. We don't. We don't have access to that information. So trying to, oh gosh, 
a, a friend of mine, he was 21, he, we were friends in New York, and we had stayed in touch, we were very close friends. He died in, uh, he was in a uh, really bad auto accident, and I remember flying up from Florida, and by the time I got there, he had already passed on, so he had just turned, we were both, we just turned 21, it was in September, his birthday was in July, mine was in August, so kids. And I remember after the funeral, we were at his family's house. You know, it was kind of a big thing, food and, you know, drink. And um, I remember sitting down, and there was, uh, there was a, a, a clergy member there. And someone had asked why. And I remember it, it stuck in my head all these years. It will never go. And I remember him saying, you know, God needed another angel. And I just remember <laughs> cringing, cringing at that, thinking to myself, why would you say that to somebody? To yeah, why couldn't God find an angel? Doesn't God have enough angels? I mean, you know, and at 21, I was thinking of this. I was nowhere near a seminary campus. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and, and I think it's in good intention. I, you know, I don't think that member of the clergy meant to do harm, but it's to show that when people are grieving, you know, it's better to say less than more. You know, it's okay to say, I don't know. It, it's totally okay to say that as long as you follow up with, I'm sorry, I'm here for you. What can I do for you? You know, because people in the midst of suffering don't want lectures. They don't. They need comfort. They need help. You know? They need an ear to bend, maybe they need to vent, scream, cuss, whatever. Throw things, throw small furniture. That's fine. You know, how people go through that process is unique. But, as Guthrie says, you know, we just don't know. We should not pretend to and do not have to feel guilty because we don't. Because we don't. We're not given, we're not, we're not privy to that information. So if we're not privy to that information you know, we shouldn't pretend that we are, right? Or think what God... And this goes back to what we were saying of, you know, of ministers, some ministers on television saying, Katrina hit New Orleans because of A, B, and C. Really? When did you get off the phone with Jesus? You know, I mean, like, <laughs> and he told you that? That's funny. He hasn't called me lately. Um, and so when we think of these things... You know, it, it, you know, you can't. We don't have these answers. We don't have these answers. And it's not just with natural disaster. It's, you know, it's disasters that, you know, take a life from us. You know, it's the confusing ones, like a child dying unexpectedly, that wreck communities that do so much damage because it's this young, beautiful life that's just started, right? So much everything. And so... Again, it's, it's not trying to pretend that we know why, but to be there to help, to be there to comfort, to offer a shoulder, right? To bring a casserole, to do something other than trying to explain why. I think it's part of our human condition to try to find an explanation for everything. Mm. And Christianity, I mean, our spiritual discipline, whatever it is, right. is a trip into the unknown and yeah. and it's learning how to say I don't know yeah. but it's okay Be and that's a huge ex acknowledgement of our vulnerability you know we don't know everything that's and right that's okay that's right you know we yeah. don't know the mystery <clears throat> it's a mystery and we'll always be a mystery but that's sure. okay Right. And that's very hard to say. It is. I mean, to accept. To accept little that little we don't know everything. And that we won't. <laughs> there are things that, you know, I but love. We want to, I mean. Sure, sure. And I, it's, it's like Guthrie's thing when we went through the doctrine of the Trinity. You know, the mystery of the Trinity, you know, the, the doctrine of the Trinity is not to, to figure it out, but to preserve the mystery of the Trinity. You know, yes, we can know some things about the Trinity. You know, we can make observations. We are never, ever going to be 100% got it. <laughs> I figured it out, you know. I'm going to write a book now. You know, it's just, you know, yes, there should be mystery. We're talking about a God that is so much greater than us. How great would God be if we were able to figure everything out? 
not so good. Yeah. Yeah, and to be able to accept that fact, that's tough. Very. That's tough. But it's liberating. It's liberating to say finally, hey, you know what? There are things about God, there are things about life and creation that I'm just never going to understand. You know, so I just have to go, keep going on and going on and just mm -hmm. doing what I'm called to do. Yeah. What did, what did she say? In my sermon, I even have this. Sarah will laugh. Elsa, what did she sing in Frozen? Let it go. Let it go. Yeah. Let it go. That song drove me crazy, but theologically <laughs> it's pretty solid. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll continue next week. Thank you. Mm-hmm.